All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good Dr. evening, Puller, Mr. Good Pat. evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Are you hearing me okay? I hear you real good. I hear you loud and clear. You hear me loud and clear. Okay, there's a little lag on your end, uh, but I, I can definitely work with it. Um, welcome to uh, another Monday, another Kingdom uh, conversation. Uh, welcome to the experience. How are these going for you, uh, for you so far, Dr. Pulley? I am enjoying the conversations. It's great to be able to talk and to get input and feedback from various panelists, also from our audience. There's so much going on and there's so many different perspectives about what's going on. So I'm interested in seeing them and I'm interested in hearing them. Okay. Well, listen, I'm interested in, in seeing them. I'm, in, I'm interested in hearing them as well. Uh, so, you know, thank you for uh, being a part every week. And thank you to uh, those of uh, you who are watching us by way of Facebook Live. Uh, we definitely appreciate you being a part of these Monday night experiences. Thank you for not only joining us yourselves, but thank you for even sharing uh, to your pages so that others, so that your friends um, can also be a part of the conversation. And we have um, a conversation indeed on tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about what about our young black men. Dr. Pulley, what about our young black men? It's time to talk. It's time to talk. There's a lot going on. There are a lot of different uh, stereotypes out there. There are a lot of different challenges that our African-American uh, young men are facing. And it's time to talk about it. It's time to put the things out on the table and to get some perspective and to, because sometimes even with the panelists that we've had so far, it's been uh, people in their 40s and their 50s um, as it relates to Black Lives Matter, as it relates to um, uh, the various issues. So I'm glad today that we have some younger people uh, to get their perspective and their position on and with regards to these these younger people, I th I think you know them. I think I think you know. I, I think these people. I think you know these people. Yes, I know them. These are my sons. I'm grateful for my natural son, my biological son, um, Minister D. Reginald uh, Pulley II. Uh, he goes by Reggie uh, for uh, Deacon Kenneth Butler, um, uh, spiritual son, and Bishop D. Walter Rogers, uh, my spiritual son as well. Okay, so then, you know, for all intents and purposes, we're going to let you call this tonight, My Three Sons. Yes, uh, it was a TV show. <laughs> it, was, it was a TV show, but tonight it's your reality, <laughs> sir. Uh, it's, it's definitely your reality. And so uh, we are uh, excited about that. And so um, if you're ready, I'm ready. And I know that, you know, being young, you know, they're younger than us. So if we're ready, you know, surely. We've been ready. Sure, the young men. Sure, the young men are, are ready. So you know we're going to start uh, with your natural seed, your biological seed, and so we're going to uh, go ahead and we're going to bring, uh, we're going to invite Reggie uh, to to the conversation. Reggie, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, and so, uh, Reggie. Good evening, son. How you feeling tonight? I'm feeling good. How you feeling that? <laughs> I'm feeling really good. Are we going to do this three times? Okay. All right. It, 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 it is all good. It is, it, it's fantastic. Um, and we also have uh, one of your spiritual sons. Uh, we've got the good, uh, uh, good Deacon Kenneth uh, Butler Jr. What's up, Kenny? Your mic. Okay, great. Okay, there we go. There Good evening, go. everybody. How you doing? How you doing tonight, <laughs> I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, certainly, uh, I, we won't even call him last, and definitely not least, uh, we also have uh, uh, the good Bishop, uh, Bishop D. Uh, Walter Rogers with us on this evening. Bishop, how are you? Yes, not, yes, not last, and certainly not least, but I'm doing absolutely wonderful. As Dr. Oh, would say, if I was doing any better, I'd be flying like Now, I'm not able to hear Bishop Rogers. Are y'all able to hear him? We're hearing pretty well. Yeah, we hear your background also, Dr. Foley. Um, but okay. we feel right here. Uh, Roger. I told you, put your phone on mute for a second and let's see if it's, if it's something with your situation that we need to. Okay. All right. 
Guys, are you able to hear me pretty clearly? Okay, cool. All right, so I think we can get through it, and I, I don't hear anyone on the thread saying that they're not able to hear at this point. Um, and so the thread is saying good evening to all of you guys. So, fellas, listen, uh, we're happy to have you uh, with us on this evening. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the experience. Uh, we're so glad uh, to be joining us on tonight. So, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, and so we're going to uh, get it going. Um, so, Reggie, as uh, as the, the Rebel Reginald Foley uh, second, um, what is it like being a young scholar? Um, you're now a minister, your dad's a bishop. Do you think that it was, uh, do you think it was just hereditary? Do you think that it was just in the DNA? You know, also my father, you know, is a woman of God, a of herself, her own right. So, so what is that like for you, as a young man of color, how a minister of having the honor under the children? Uh, what was that experience like for you? Um, it was a very, it was a different experience, I would say. Um, I didn't have the usual expectations of where my parents were kind of close my hand and went along a particular route. They really just allowed me to be myself and discover how I went about making up my own. Um, so that really allowed me to do some other things, try different things. But also, I had naturally just kind of gravitated towards the things that were in my parents. And it's just the So I just kind of got to like that. When I got that out into here, definitely, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it to the best of your ability. And that's definitely a stand up. Okay, gotcha. So what we want to do is we want to check the moment. They're saying we've got like some background uh, echo going on. Uh, so let's see what we can do to figure this out real quick. Um, not a problem. Uh, not a big deal. Um, let's uh, let's all of you go on mute, and I'm going to see. I'll start with me. All right. So it sounds like, and I'm going to ask the audience to help me out. Um, if everybody can give me like a thumbs up if you're able to. Mr. Patrick, uh, I think it's gone. I don't hear it anymore. You think it's gone? You, you, all of a sudden, you just don't hear it no more. I don't hear it anymore at all. It was it's, like yeah, a I don't bad static. It was bad. Okay, but it's gone now. Okay, all right. So let's uh, let's bring D Reginald uh, back and let's let's bring Reggie back and let's see if we're clear. Okay, uh, all right. All right. Tyrell says we're good. All right, and, I, and this and for what it's worth, I appreciate our 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 Facebook producers. We appreciate when you all talk to us. We appreciate when you all say, "Look, we can't hear y'all. We got to echo. Look, we we look. We're a family. So, welcome to that conversation is needed. And so, uh, you know, Reggie, you were saying some good things. Like, for example, I could hear you say even through the echo that it wasn't forced on you. So, I'm going to throw it back at you again, if you don't mind. Um, as a young minister, what was it like growing up uh, in the influence of having both of your parents um, as uh, a man and a woman of, of the word of the gospel. Um, right, like I was saying before, it wasn't really a, a hard process. My parents didn't force my hand. They didn't make me do anything. They allowed me to have the space and the freedom to live life and enjoy enjoy being young and just kind of experience life for myself. Like my parents never really stripped me. They wanted me to enjoy life. But ultimately, I think they both had the faith of, you know, if you train a child up in a way they should go, when they grow older, they'll never depart from. I think they kind of had that faith where we know he won't depart from this. And it, it came to fruition, honestly, because uh, with both my parents were pastors and preaching. I kind of found my way back to it, but not back to it, I would say, but more so in it deep like my parents are because, you know, that's who I'm made up of. And so I, as my grandma would say, I have it honest. And so it's not really something I got to do certain things. It's just, it's just in me. And so... But once I did commit to the call, both of my parents did require me to be at a certain level of excellence of not just going and getting mediocrely, but actually putting my all into it and going as far and as deep and as God wants me to and really committing to this life. 
Okay, that's awesome. And listen, uh, for those of you that uh, that know you, um, that know your parents, uh, we, we're celebrating you, and we're celebrating the fact that you know you're getting to do it your own way, that you're getting to be your own uh, individual, authentic expression in the earth. So congratulations for that. And I know you're making, uh, you continue to make both of your parents uh, proud. Uh, the good Deacon Kenneth Butler Jr. Good evening, sir. Okay, good evening. Yes, sir. And so um, a spiritual son, um, a, a young man of color, a young African-American male, um, you know, with the at your uh, broadcast. Um, are you doing it every single night now? Yeah, Monday through Thursday. All right. And so as a young man of Monday color. Monday through Thursday, you cut out Sunday. Right? Oh, no, I still do Sunday. It's Sunday through Thursday. I'm on Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, Sunday through Thursday. I'm off Friday. I'm off Saturday. <laughs> oh, but you are like your day. You know, he's like, I don't do weekends. I don't do holidays. I don't. Do <laughs> I, I do. I do something else on Friday nights, but I don't like to overwork myself. I'm a very. <laughs> you do something okay. else. So the young man of color says, "I do something else on Friday night." Preach to oh. a different group of people live. Yeah, your daddy. Exactly. Look. We, we just try to have some conversation on tonight. I'm sure the people with you are hearing what this, yeah, what else this young man of color gets into. But hey, I have a young man of color walking with the Lord, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Do you find it challenging to be young and and be that man of God, a young man of God? Um, I wouldn't call it challenging. It is. It is. Um. It's different. I mean, I'm not like my peers, um, I, but I've never been like my peers. I've always been around older people, um, and it's always been my life. So I haven't really been exposed to um, peers outside of the church. I've been in church all my life. Um, I've been exposed to some type of ministry all of my life. And so it, it was my norm growing up. So it wasn't really challenging. It's just all that I know. When I try to go around other people or or be around other people who are my age who don't do church, then that's when it feels challenging and awkward and I feel, you know, I don't belong. Um, but I wouldn't say challenging. I would just say um, I'm fortunate. You know, we people who grew up in church, we get a piece of common sense that other people don't get. And so um we, we we mature along a lot a lot faster in a lot of different ways. So um, it's not challenging. It's, it's fortunate. It is an advantage. That's how I see it. And we have uh, Bishop Tina A. Dorsey on the line tonight, and she says that she truly enjoys uh, your nightly reviews. Um, I've had the pleasure. Hey, if you've not had the pleasure of uh, or, or had the opportunity to be blessed by the nightly review. Um, I think, where can they find it on Facebook? On my personal page, Sunday through uh, Thursday at 925, I go live um, for the nightly review, Sunday through Thursday, right on my personal page, Kenneth Butler Jr. Okay, you heard it right here. Uh, Bishop D. Walter Rogers Jr., evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right, how are you this evening? I'm doing great. So, uh, Bishop, I've known you uh, for, for a, a few years now, and uh, let's see, you don't have to give your age tonight, but, we, we, but we're comfortable with saying that you're a young man of color, mm -hmm. and you're a young man of color, and I've known you as a bishop since I've known you. I've known you as a man of color since I've known you, and I've known you as, as a bishop since I've known you. You've been you. a man since I've known you. You've been a color since I know you. Right, right, right. Since I know you. So, you know, so, so great job on stability. Great, great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nothing that has changed. We celebrate your, your consistency on that. Um, and so we thank God for that. Um, do you know a Derek Devin Jones Jr.? Yes, yes. He's, okay. um, he's one of my members. Uh, um, excuse me. They are one of my members at Beyond Church. Uh, they are uh, my... Uh, grant writer. Hey, 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 hey! W welcome, 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 Derek. Well, he, I just want you to know that he's he's very proud. He's like, that's my leader. So, <laughs> so, Derek, welcome to the conversation. Yes, we're blessed to have your leader with us on tonight. Uh, but Bishop, as a young man of color who also represents the Episcopacy, what is that walk like? Um, 
I, I, and, and with, you know, I do believe in being transparent. Uh, it hasn't always been the the uh, the easiest. It has been. It had some challenges. One with overcoming individuals. Um, I see one of my frat brothers go mob. Um, going with dealing one with my age. Uh, I am. I'll be thirty three this year, and so having that challenge. And so that was that was that was a bit of a challenge when individuals see me and well, how are you and this and the fourth. Uh, and one thing I and I you know take pride in telling them is that you know, I, this did this didn't come off of a credentialing meal. I didn't go pay a hundred dollars and receive any of my credentials or anything uh, at all. I am a, a bishop uh, in the Church of the Everlasting Kingdom with Dr. Darrell Pulis, residing prelate. So and that alone lets us know you're legit. That, yeah. that, that, that with and of itself <laughs> lets us know that you're legit. Too legit to quit, for crying out Too loud. Yes. Bishop, I don't know if it's on my end, but I didn't hear anything Bishop Rogers said. <laughs> and when and when Deacon Kenneth is talking, it's like the static cover. I don't know if it's on my end, but I didn't hear it. I can see his mouth move, but I didn't hear anything. Can you so, hear me? <laughs> Yeah, but by the mere fact that the conversation is moving and going and he and I are interacting, that lets us know that we can hear. Okay, all right. Okay. Let's see what we can do to, to figure that out with your end, but the conversation is definitely moving. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, all right. Uh, but, you know, I'll sum it up, but it, it, it's, and also, too, with, I, I've been, I, I, too, have been in church pretty much all my life. I always say that uh, as soon as I was, a my mom was able to leave the hospital with me, the first stop was church. We used to go to church Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And sometimes on Sunday it would be three times on Sunday. And so having to find that balance, of course, starting in church. And then there was a period of time uh, where I just didn't fit in in any place whatsoever. And so I desired to do the things that people who were teenagers did and I did do that, but I didn't feel right to me. And so then I had, you know, I, you know, came on back and um, and just realized that I'm I, I'm different. I'm not. I can't do everything. Kind of similar to um, Kenny's uh, comment, I, things, them things I tried to do, I couldn't do. They would get away with it. I wouldn't get away with it. It just it just didn't work for me. And so uh, it, it it has it present has presented some challenges, but it's very rewarding and rewarding. And I would never. Um, I never I don't regret anything, and I don't. Um, um, and I'm and I'm I'm satisfied with the decisions that I made to uh, to continue um, in in ministry. So, Dr. Pulley, we have again. Um, you know, we have three of your sons: one biological, two spiritual, uh, on the line tonight. And so, uh, the question that we'd like to ask you is. What is it like as both a biological and a spiritual father um, mentoring, raising, rearing, nurturing young men of color in today's society and knowing um, how to find that, that balance, uh, knowing uh, how to bring in that, that correction, that nurture? You know, what, is, what is that like with all this going on in the world today? Well, um, one of the things I was thinking about, and it had me reflecting on raising um, uh, first my biological son, um, uh, D. Reginald, is that they talk about this conversation that you that African American fathers need to have with their sons as it relates to being stopped by the police. And I was just thinking to myself, and um, D. Reginald, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't ever remember having a conversation with you to say because you're a black young man, if you're stopped by the police, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. I don't ever remember having that conversation with you. Do you remember me giving you? No, never had that conversation. Okay, okay. Um, and so did you feel like, like you were ill-equipped because we didn't have that conversation? Did you feel less prepared, like I missed that, you know, totally. I, I, I felt less prepared by the time I could start driving. I already learned that in school, just as a precaution. Uh, at my high school, they taught us in our American government classes, like what to do when you get stopped by the police. 
And so they taught us about training on the interior lights so at nighttime, placing your hands on the steering wheel, um, you know, how to speak and different things like that. And also just through like movies and things like that, about ad being taught in the movie, kind of picking those things up, just kind of learn on the way. I, that's how I, I learned on the way. I, I think that's phenomenal that, I, um, what are you saying, that you learned a lot of that in school. I think that's great that they taught you. Uh, generationally, I don't remember learning that in school. And I can remember a few years ago being stopped by the police. And, you know, not that I've gotten a whole lot of speeding tickets in my life or been pulled over a lot, but, you know, it's happened. I, I can remember at least one time that it has happened. And so you kind of learn the drill. You know they're going to ask for your license, your registration, and things of that nature. And so on this particular reason, not sure why I was being pulled over. Go figure. And I'll, I'll go ahead and say it now that even at the end, when, even when I left the experience, I still wasn't quite clear as to why I had been pulled over. But knowing the drill, license, registration, when they pulled me over, I immediately started getting my license and my registration and things of that nature, you know, because if you know me, I'm a, you know, proactive kind of guy, so let me get my stuff ready. So I'm in the glove compartment. And that, beca that became a problem. That was a thing, as Dr. Pulley sometimes says. Um, and so I, it was a thing, and I didn't even realize it was a thing. And, it, it, you know, I had to get out of my car, and they had to, they wanted to search my car. And, you know, just the whole nine, I'm thinking I'm just being proactive and getting ready. The fact that I went in my glove compartment, um, that was that was a thing. That was a, a major thing. Um, and so um, I, I don't know if any of you, have any of you had any types of experiences um, with, uh, with the authorities or, or with the police um, that were, hmm, I'm not really sure if this was on the up and up. Have that ever happened to any of you? Bishop Raj, I see you um, uh, nodding your head. Talk to us. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Um, I, I don't, even with my biological father, uh, Deacon uh, Rogers Sr., I don't, I've never, we, we never had that conversation either of, you know, this is what you would do. It was just something that I kind of picked up, um, you know, kind of by, you know, kind of watching movies or seeing, um, seeing other people being pulled over, what have you, people of color. Um, but one one instance, I was coming. Um, Eric and myself were coming back up from Florida. Um, we rented a, uh, a, a, a I think it was a suburban. It was a black suburban was empty because we're helping some some individuals move down to Florida. And I was pulled over. I was driving. I was pulled over. Be and the reason that day I got pulled over was I kind of went over the line just a little bit. And the one that never gave uh, gave me a sobriety test, never asked me was I drinking or anything. Um, he asked for the license registration and then asked us, uh, two black men asked us to get out of the vehicle with, uh, with the white police officer, get out the vehicle and begin to search the vehicle for drugs because this type of vehicle coming from Florida empty is normally trafficking drugs. But you told me I was pulled over because I crossed over the line just a little bit. But now you're tearing up this rental car, um, literally searching in the door cracks. I mean, underneath the vehicle, everywhere, because this fits a description of a typical vehicle that is trafficking drugs. And so at that point, I was feeling very frustrated and another white police officer comes up and I'm telling, kind of yelling at this officer, like, you know, this is wrong. Like, what are you, like, how, oh, I, I'm not, I just got here. So, you know, this is what he's doing. I'm just here for just mere backup. And I'm like, you clearly know he stopped me because I was poor, you know, I, he said I was bearing over the line, but now you're literally, and he left the vehicle trashed, left the vehicle trashed and said, okay, yeah, you all can go about your way. And he says, I wouldn't be surprised if you get stopped again because of this same reason. And I said, is that the reason because I was veered over the line or because there's two black men um, in an empty suburban that could potentially be tra tra uh, trafficking drugs? Uh, have a good day, uh, sir. And gave my license registration back and went on about his business. So, so no apology, no no consolation, nothing. No, no, no. We're well within our rights, so deuces, and, and that's it. We're out.
that that's it. It was not, it was they were out. And at that point of being he in that in that moment, not thinking about, okay, let me get his badge number. Let me get let me let me what precinct like not thinking of those things. You know, these are things that you kind of think about afterwards. Like, okay, like man, I should have got I should I, you know, I, it would have been good to do this and to do that. But it was there was nothing, no consulates, no anything, nothing. Wow. Um, uh, Kenny, uh, uh, Reggie, um, have any of you ever uh, had any similar type of experiences? Um, I've, I've definitely had experience. Uh, I go to school in uh, Southbury, North Carolina. And um, one time uh, I was driving my car through, I was getting out of a movie and I was driving my car through like the movie parking lot. But I kind of drove along like the back line that wasn't necessarily a street. And so it was like two o'clock in the morning, I come out. No, no one's there. I don't stop all the way, but I do come out of the turn at a stop sign. I don't stop all the way. I make the right hand turn. And then I go about a mile, two miles down the road. And then the police had followed me about two miles to my next destination. And they said, We're stopping you because of you ran a stop sign. I'm like, But well, where is there a stop? And there's no stop sign for the pads. You know, mile, mile and a half. There's no stop sign anywhere. They said, "Oh, it was all the way back there at the shopping center," and like they even acknowledged that it was a far ways back. So I'm confused. I'm like, "Well, why did you follow me all this way? If that was the reason you pulled me over, why didn't you do anything?" Because at this point, I had noticed them behind me for about two or three lights now, and they said, "Oh, well, we just had to pull you over now." And so that interaction was just. I was so confused as to why he was following. I remember talking to my dad about that. He was saying, was probably watching you to see if you were going to make another mistake, if you were going to do anything else. And because you didn't, you just decided to pull you over that point. And I'm just, at that point, I was just really confused. Like, I didn't understand why they pulled me over. At this point, it feels for that jump. Like, if they would have pulled me over when they got behind me and I noticed them, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But we're like two miles down the road now. Why were you following me and telling me this whole entire time, trying to you know, make this a scene? And yeah, I, I, I'm not angry to anyone. It was just I did a rolling stop at a stop sign. Yeah, I, I think that sometimes when you drive a certain car, um, <laughs> that we're not supposed to drive certain cars, or we're on high alert. So if you are nineteen, certain old man driving a um, a BMW, you know it's it's you know that's going to stand out. Does does his do his parents know that he's driving this car? Is it his car? Is the car stolen? You know, sometimes there can be a perception that we're not to be prosperous because of our color, because of our age, that we're not supposed to be prosperous. So I think that um, I think that sometimes that that raises flags. Just the type of car that you're driving can be associated with a certain type of of stereotype. Yeah, stereotype is the word, and and then also targets, and and I don't want to forget. Um, I didn't want any copyright infringement uh, situations, and so I want to encourage everyone uh, tonight to go after this stream to go to the Kingdom Conversations page, and uh, there's going to be a, a brief video um, about about being targeted, and, and and we encourage you to just watch that. It's like a six minute and forty second video, and leave your response, leave your reaction. Um, and I'll, I'll try to remember to say it, but I'm going to say it now in case I do forget to say it at the end. I hope I don't. Um, but it, it definitely ties into what we're talking about. And so, Kenny, I hear you saying that you've not had those type of experiences. Um, but with regards to uh, young men of color, um, what age do, would, do you think would be the appropriate age um, for a father? You know, I heard Dr. Pauly say, you know, we didn't really, you know, find it necessary to have that conversation. Um, but of course, we know things are very different now. Mm -hmm. What age do you recommend as being like the appropriate age to talk to, um, for a father to talk to his son, for a mother who's raising a son, uh, for parents to talk to their son? Okay, <clears throat> you can hear me? Okay, good. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I'm saved and sanctified, and that's why I haven't had any of these drastic experiences that you guys have had. I'm saved, sanctified, and filled. Well, but praise the Lord. Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Yeah. But I want to know they pull the saved and the sanctified over, too. <laughs> well, I ain't got a cause, so there's that. <laughs> but um, 
But I, 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 um, I thought about when you asked the question about the salvation thing. When, it, when I was growing up in church, you were um, bound to the church and you were saved from birth until you were able to make a decision, until you understood, until you were able to understand the plan of salvation on your own and decide. And that was somewhere like around 12. That's what they would tell us, like 12, 12 years old. You're gonna. Um, you need to get saved again. You need to get baptized because you're making the decision for yourself now. And so you got christened and sprinkled as a as a baby. But at 12, that was like the age that we had to do it again. We had to go up under. And so um, I would I would say you didn't, go, you didn't quite go under the last the first time because you were too young. They didn't want to harm you as a baby. But right. You right. Become adolescent. You can you can handle the submarine. You know. Yeah. yeah, you can be yeah. dipped down in the blood. You see, yeah. Yeah. they just give you a little taste of it just to cover you in that first part. <laughs> but you ain't gonna be going nowhere to do nothing sinful, so you're fine. But yeah. after twelve, you know, you get in school around all those people, and it's it can be dangerous. So, <laughs> but um, I think that that age, I I really think that it's more about um, based on experience. Like if you're um, if it's not twelve, and if you have a sixteen year old and they're starting driving or they're pursuing their license, then that may be a good time to have a conversation like that as they move forward with getting their license and things like that. That as situations arise, because you can't really say an age. Like we live in a day now where it's five-year-olds that understand more than I get about Facebook and about technology. And so we don't really, it's, but it's as a child understands and as they have need to um, know this information as a result of an experience that may be better for them. Definitely, and you know we have uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, followers on tonight saying as early as a teenager, and so we're going to ask you know our, our other uh, uh, other people in our, our Facebook audience, you know, what age do you think is the appropriate age uh, for a parent to talk to their son? about the police and, and those things that are out there um, so that they can be aware, so that they can be prepared, so that they can be proactive, and um, so they can so that they can be ready. Um, are you kidding? Mr. Baxter, yes, sir. I was wondering how much of this is the police and the energy that we get from the police is shaped by our perception of the police. Because, you know, I grew up with Officer Friendly. You know, I didn't grow up seeing the police Ooh. as something negative or something bad. And 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 I've never had that experience. But I think as these images are in the media, as these images are in the music, as these images are in the movies, I think that it becomes a part of the collective consciousness that kind of shapes this idea that I should be afraid. Um, and I've had clients that have asked me, well, what do I say to my you know, grandmothers, I don't want my grandson to be shot. Uh, mothers and fathers, I don't want my son to be shot. What do I say to them? And it's like, I don't know that there is something that you can specifically say, because there are people who did all the right things. They put their hands where they were supposed to put them. They pulled out their license or didn't pull them out or asked for permission. And they were still shot. They were still killed. So I don't know that the conversation guarantees their safety. I think it's a deeper um, thing of perception that has to change. Because sometimes um, uh, one of my clients says it's like they felt like, um, like, you know, how, and, and I'm, I'm not saying the police are dogs in any kind of way. Mm. Um, they were saying, you know how dogs smell fear. And when they smell that fear, that they react to you in a certain way because they, they, they can smell and sense and feel. It's an analogy, fear. but it's an appropriate analogy. Right. It's, they're dogs, but it's an right, analogy. Right. And so I wonder if some of this is maybe the conversation that I need to have with D. Reginald and with um, Kenny and with um, D. Walter is to not be afraid of the police. Maybe <clears throat> the conversation needs to be switched to say, do not be afraid of the police, to, um, to take some deep breaths, to be calm, to remember that you are one with the police, that there's no separation between you and the police, regardless of their gender, regardless of their age, regardless of their color, 
do not fear. And that's what the angels would say to people in the most terrifying situation, be not afraid. And maybe that's the conversation that we need to start having instead of being afraid of the police and you better be careful. Maybe the conversation is to relax. Maybe the conversation is that if you feel anxiety or fear, let's take some deep breaths. To see this police officer as a beloved offspring of God, perfect, whole, and complete. I'm one with this police officer. There's no separation between me and this officer. Maybe the conversation needs to change um, so that we're not um, uh, releasing that fear and that we're not projecting getting that fear back to us. Because I believe that the people who kill are just as afraid as the people who are being killed. And I think it's this fear that's going around of, of fear. And the Bible says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. And so the more that we can see our unity and our oneness, then I believe that we can uh, let go of some of the fear. And I hear you. And Dr. Plitt, let me tell you something. As, as one of your... As, as one of your followers that you listen you almost had me you all man you almost had me hook line and sinker until you got to the part where you said you think that it's fear on both parts but i'm you know i can't help but wonder yeah yeah we're both scared but, but only one of us has a gun and so you know you know you got a gun i don't have a gun what you know what you scared of and so that i'm just saying for me that, right. that was that was like you know you you scared. I'm scared of the images that have been presented of African American males in the media. I'm afraid right. that maybe have to pull the trigger, sir. Right, uh -huh. handcuff me, but get your knee off my neck. I mean, you know, if you, you, you fear. I mean, that that that's like. Um, but it's, it's it's almost like if you can you can take a um an animal that's been caged right and they've been taught to fear getting out and even though you open up the, the the cage and they can get out and walk there's still fear there that they don't believe that they can and so even though i have a gun and i'm a police officer if i'm still intimidated and i'm still afraid of a person because of their age or their gender or their culture me having a gun doesn't necessarily make me feel and i can kill them and still be scared that i haven't killed enough that they're gonna come and get me so i think it's it's this desensitization that needs to take place on both ends that that there is fear there what else would cause you to do that but fear is that we are there are only two energies love and fear either i'm operating in fear or i'm operating in love perfect love is the only thing that will cast out fear so I if i'm not you. operating I in love you. i'm not operating hear in fear you about the love and the fear and bishop i'm going to say this last thing to, to to your father you're right two energies in the world love and fear but i would just encourage the one that had the gun to go on and switch over to love d walter you wanted to say something on tonight you know i i do believe that uh, when you originally asked the question, uh, oh, I, I, wish I, I, was, I was going along the same <laughs> the same lines of uh, the same lines of Dr. Of Dr. Pulley as far as um, te as far as teaching uh, and changing the conversation and kind of changing the narrative. And I believe that it's about it's about education. And if we're honest, there is a and I and I and I've said this and I've had this conversation with Dr. Pulley and um, and so, you know and my peers that. There is there's a larger conversation that needs to happen within uh, the black community and the brown community, the people of color community. That um, how about we educate our children about what is you know what the, our local laws are? How about we educate? Okay, listen, I know you may feel that you didn't do anything, but that doesn't give you a right to cuss the police officer out. That doesn't give okay that they're saying. You know, hey, did you you put your hands on the thing? Yeah, we yes, we do all of those things, and of course, you know, it, it des doesn't necessarily because the thing is, if if there's hatred in somebody's heart, regardless, like you know, regardless of what's happening, I mean, that's it'll it'll still it can it can still happen. But if we uh, we have to be able to te teach our children or the you know the younger ones that okay. Let's. I, I know what you see in the media. I know what you hear on the radio. Uh, I know what you know. What your fa your famous rapper is saying uh, in in his lyrics. But here's a reality. First of all, they've got billions, millions of dollars 
to go and bail themselves out and to do what they need to do. But when you come back on, on to this level of what, let, what are we what are we teaching? What are we saying? And so I think the conversation has to change around centered around what are our rights? What what is our law? Uh, what is your temperament? Um, and I did see someone um, say that you know if if we're acting afraid, what do you have to hide? It's not necessarily that, but it's it is about what has been portrayed uh, in in the media and what is what has happened before because. I, 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 my, my license is fine. My registration is fine. My, all of my lights and everything work on my car. But when a police officer gets behind me, there's a, there's a level of, okay, now when I, I'm, I'm running through my head with all of these things, what's right? Did I, did I stop at that stop sign? Did I, you know, did I run that yellow? Like what, what is, what's going on? That's, and that's a part of something that, you know, I have to work on knowing that I didn't do anything. So I'm fine. Um, but it's all about. I think it's all about changing our conversation uh, with um, with with the younger generation now. Like you know, there's a yes. There's a lot of you know potential. A lot of hatred out toward police. But what can we do? What can you do um, as a result of being pulled over or even being confronted by a, a person from law enforcement? Because it could be a black person, a black law enforcement officer. It could be a white law enforcement officer. It could be a Hispanic law enforcement officer. It's just about how, what is our attitude toward them. So it sounds like we all agree that a conversation should be had, um, but and giving respect to Dr. Pulley's um, uh, theory, uh, but that we can consider perhaps changing the narrative some so that it's not, the narrative is not based uh, on fear, uh, but that it's based on understanding that we are all equal um, and just teaching them how to handle it appropriately. Dr. Play, did I get that accurately? Yeah, yeah, because, um, D. Roger, you look, you wanted to say something about that. Did you want to say something? I'm, I'm in kind of, I was just, I I get what you're talking about, like, how, like, like definitely, I agree with the conversation, but in the conversation that I think we had, I do think that sometimes it needs to be about getting to what's the truth and getting to that this is something that can happen. And as the conversation is, let me prepare you for what can happen. Because because if you, but I do get when if someone doesn't have positive interaction with the police, then well, based off that conversation, it affirms that this is something to be fearful of. But me and one of my lines of work, I interact with the police often and we crack jokes with, and they're just regular people. But that doesn't change the fact that the truth of the matter is that I still need to behave in this proper manner when I get pulled over. I still need to behave in this proper manner when I interact with the police because not necessarily about, you know, I, it is about love and fear. And I'm definitely one of those people who believe that if I set the tone, if I set the energy, then they yes. have to yeah, yeah. Just people with heart problems who ignore that, and people are having bad days, and people are fearful, and it's it it it, it overweighs that. And so, like you said, you can do everything right, but you can also do everything wrong. And the person that did everything right and the person that did everything wrong doesn't it can end up in the same situation. So it's not about doing the right things or not doing things. It's about just being prepared in that situation and doing everything you have power because ultimately. And this is why I think everybody is getting that. It is too much power in the hands of the police to be able to make that decision based on where they're at. Because as we all know, there are people who are Jesus, embodied perfect love and walk this earth. But there were still people who feared him to the point where they killed him. And so even if you're in the point of perfect love, people are still going to fear you enough to the point where they kill you. Now in your death, what does that spark as a part of God's plan? That's the other step. But it doesn't negate the fact that the fear outweighed the perfect love that killed the, that killed the person. And that's in the decision, and that's in the decider's hand, which is the police. And in that time, the Jews who decide to do that, it was who has the power to make that call. And that's, I think, what the conversation is about, is this person has that power that you don't have. And so you need to behave in this manner so that way you can probably put yourself in the best situation possible, not guaranteeing, not guaranteeing anything, but just putting yourself and preparing yourself as best as you can. And Jesus, and Jesus said, I need y'all to know that I'm not scared of y'all, that you can't take my life, that the only way that I'm gonna die is I lay it down. 
you don't have that kind of power to take my life. So I'm not fearing man, which kills the body. But my, if I'm a fear, it's going to be God who is able to kill the body. And the Bible says put the soul in hell. But I think this fear is, I think it's still an element there where we realize the police does not control my life. That we think that our lives are in the hands of the police, and it's not, because your life is in the hand of God. You have a divine purpose that you come to this earth with, and how you're going to come and how you're going to leave is set before you even take on this physical form. So it's not in the hands of the police, that, and neither was it in the hands of the Roman oppressors that killed Jesus. They don't have that kind of power. No man takes my life. He said, I lay it down. You can't take it. And I think we believe that somebody can kill us, that somebody can take our lives. And I think that's given too much power to another human being. I think it's our purpose that keeps us literally immortal. And until that purpose is fulfilled, I don't care if it's the police on the right side of the bed, on the wrong side of the bed. I don't care if you try to kill yourself. Until your purpose is fulfilled, you ain't going nowhere. So I do want to go to the thread, Dr. Pulley, but, and, I, and I hear and I give all respect to, to the manner in which you are speaking, but it just makes us think that based on that particular theory, then why fight injustice at all if no man can take my life? Why not just go ahead and, and just accept it and, and, let, and let things unfold? Because uh, we I have to create my life. You can't take it, but I can co-create with God the life that I desire and deserve right here on the earth. So I don't have to live in that particular way, but you can't take my life. Can't, you. can't people co-create their lives to conspire against you? Say that again. Can't people create their life, create in their life to conspire against you? Sure, people can conspire against you, but they don't have the final say. Right, wait, wait, that's what I'm saying. We're not talking about final say. We're talking about the act. Um, sure, sure. We, 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 yes, we interact. But I was specifically talking about the fear of the police killing you, and because they have a weapon, because they have a gun, because they have a title or position, that I need to fear them taking my life. That was the the right. the, the specific yeah. point I was talking about. Um, yeah. and, and and the kingdom conversation is all about perspective. It's all about consciousness. And we welcome all perspectives. We welcome yes. all we welcome all manner of consciousness because it all adds to the health and the wellness of this conversation. Dr. Philly, thank you for adding week to week to the <laughs> health and the wellness of the conversation. <laughs> Renee Denar Cole um, suggests that whenever that child is having experiences without the parents accompanying them that's a good time to have the conversation. Good. Um, I do want to give a shout out to this parent, my son, S-U-N. I, lo I, I, I love um, that example, that model of, you know, raising our young black men, raising our, our um, young men of color, and, you know, speaking of them um, in that positivity, um, in, in that high level of consciousness. My S-U-N will be 12 this year. The person shares, his mother shares, we plan to talk with him soon, we believe he falls on the spectrum. That would be autism. Uh, so it's all the more important to help him get an understanding of what he may face in this world. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And I want to give a shout out because it's the month of July, which is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And so uh, we know that uh, when it comes to mental health, mental health even or particularly in, um, in the community of people of color, it, 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 is, it is important, it is, it is significant. Um, uh, Bishop D. Walter Rogers, Jr., um, for a young man of color, would you see the need or the necessity um, to go and talk to somebody for, for, you know, for the sake of mental health or for mental wellness um, at, at a young age? What, what are your thoughts about that? In, 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 uh, Bishop Beckley, in regards to what? I'm, I just wanted to make sure I'm answering your question. As a young man of color, would you see a need? Do, do you, would you consider there to be such a need for young men of color uh, to go and to just sit down and talk with someone like a mental health professional, oh. uh, perhaps sort through their emotions or sort through their feelings or what they may be dealing with or faced with? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, because one of the things um, in, in, in the black community, especially um, with the men of color, um, 
and I, and I thank God that I did not have this experience growing up, but there I have uh, peers who have had this uh, uh, growing up where their, you know, their father you know, said that their, their emotions, uh, men didn't display emotions. And if they displayed emotions, they uh, would get mm. hit. They would get, you know, punched. Mm. They would, um, for all you know, intensive work. You know, just just putting this in, in what they would say. You know, uh, men who cry or who express their feelings are sissies, and um, and so I think as time has progressed and and and, and as, as as progressive as the, you know the gen my generation and the generation behind me have come, now it's it's becoming we're we're unfolding more of, and and realizing that. Okay, especially with the church. Okay, hey, it, no, it's 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 not a demon, but you know, it's not the devil. But you are experiencing a manic depression. You are experiencing schizophrenia. Like you know, these are these are issues that um, are relating to a, perhaps a chemical imbalance that that that's happening within within your within your mind, um, and so. It is it is it is very important, and um, and I and I and I speak that from um, from a personal experience where there was a period of time in my life where I did experience um, some depression, and I did seek out some help because um, if if we try to hold it all in, it's kind of like a, I always give the analogy of uh, of a soda. You shake the soda up, and then you just try to open it. It, you, it's just going to ex explode everywhere, and then now you have you know soda on the wall, on the carpet, and the ceiling, and you now you're trying to clean this all up, but it's just it's just all out there now because you didn't take the time to let it calm let it calm down or what have you. So I think it's very important for um, for uh, black men, um, young men uh, that may be having some experiencing those things. And it doesn't mean that you have to be on medication. It may just simply mean that, hey, you just need to talk, talk it out, talk it through, and then perhaps then you then you may be okay. I think that ne there's a negative stereotype of if I go see a counselor, if I go see a therapist, I'm crazy. Something's wrong with me. Are they are they going to commit me to the psych ward? You know, are they going to think you know are they going to think something different of me or what have you? So no, I think it's it's, it's very important. It's it's it's, it's vital in my opinion yeah um I, and I, I i appreciate that and i appreciate um that the perspective that you offered about sometimes growing up in our community in particular um you know based on you know how our parents were you know i can remember hearing things like you know oh you know you get counseling you're weak you know you know uh -huh. things of that nature so uh kenny i want to ask you this question um, um if i um if i can um kenny um for a young man of color, and we have uh, Dr. Pulley on the line tonight, who is a, was a licensed psychologist, um, as well as a spiritual leader, do you think that it would be beneficial as a young man of color to seek uh, mental health, mental wellness, and have a man, another man of color, such as Dr. Pulley, uh, that he can go to uh, for uh, for such support in, in with regards to his uh, mental health um, well. Yeah, I think that I think that um, more than I think that that is the that is the conversation that that is not. Um, I want to go back a little bit to deal Absolutely. with that um, perspective thing because it's about how you see yourself. If um, that fear on the other side is also respect. And a lot of us, we don't respect ourselves. We don't see ourselves as, as, as who God sees us. And so then that translates in how we live our life. It translates into what shows up when we get pulled over by police or we get into situations with authorities because we see ourselves in a certain way um, that is demeaning and lower. Then, um, and so I think that that is where the conversation is. The conversation is in talking about us and how we see ourselves. And, 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 and yeah, we need therapy. We need, you need to lay on somebody's couch. I'm a firm believer. You need to go lay on somebody's couch and talk about your trauma, talk about your childhood, because that is where it came from. A lot of us, um, how we see ourselves, it started in where we grew up. Like we were taught to hide. I was taught growing up, um, what goes on in the butler house stays in the butler house. And, mm. and, that, 
<laughs> you know, we I don't care what was happening. I don't care what was what was going on. It could be I don't know what was happening. I don't care Please. what was going on. I wish you would go down there to anybody, the church, the school, and act like you've been to part your lips to say something about what's going on in this house. And so we grew up um, pretending and masking and putting on a facade. We grew up pretending to be okay. And like Roger said, with, with um, not displaying our emotions, not being in touch with our feelings, not being in touch with really going what's really going on. And I think that um, for myself, um, having a person like Dr. Pulley, who is licensed and clinical and therapeutic and all of that other stuff, just as, as, as who he is, and even though I didn't necessarily know that I needed counseling, know that I needed therapy, know that this was a thing just by talking to him. He, he got a way of pulling it out of you. You know, he tell me, say more about that. You know, the things that he'll say to have you, have you, have you saying more about it and realize, oh, wait a minute, I need to go sit on somebody's couch and have a conversation. And so I think that the, the conversation that we're having is not outside of ourselves. It is about us. It is within us. And we need to deal with us because um, I think for myself, and this is just me, um, I can only speak on, on about me. I don't have um, fear around being a young black man in society and getting pulled over by the police or getting, in, getting into run-ins with the authorities and all of that. I don't have it because I'm aware and I have become more aware and I continue to become aware of my purpose. And so I know that there are some people who are, um, that is their path. A part of their path and what God has called them to do is be in situations where they get into it with the authorities or they have these exchanges so that they can fulfill their purpose. That's not, you know, that's not my purpose. It's not where I'm, that's not my path. And so I don't have a fear about it because it's not it's not for me. And I don't come against other people who are protesters and get into, you know, um, you know, being very some people are very opinionated and very, um, very into um, Black Lives Matter and, and, and being cautious and all of that. But for me, that's not I don't have that fear. And it's because I know what Dr. Pilly was saying earlier that I can't make my transition until my purpose is fulfilled. And even if I get pulled over, even if I have a negative encounter with the, with the authorities, that's not if going to get shot. If I get shot, I've been shot. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I have a bullet in my leg today. So like the theater thing, um, what, what I was more terrified of was people seeing my limp, you know, and knowing that I got shot. And the stereotype that came along with having a bullet in my leg more than I was, oh, I'm getting pulled over. You know, let me let me breathe. It's just and um, and, I, and that's why I said earlier about the um, about being raised in the church, I, because I was raised in the church. All we did was church. We went to church. Everything we did, it was up front. It was godly. So when I, I the few times that I saw my dad get pulled over. You know, my mother was in the passenger seat speaking in tongues. You know, my dad, you know, he pulled out his license, his registration. It wasn't a thing. So I, I've never seen it. So as far as I'm concerned, it's about perspective. And I think that this conversation is about how you see yourself. And some people need therapy to help them with how they see themselves. I'll fall out. We have um, a, a Facebook viewer, and actually a childhood friend, my best friend from childhood, who's on the line with us tonight. Um, and she says, I think that is a powerful question. What would the perception be if we saw more African-American men in those clinical roles to impart wisdom into those without that male role model or strong male presence in their lives? I work in human services, and it's rare to see African-American males in clinical roles, at least here, in Virginia. So Dr. Pulley, we take a moment uh, to salute you uh, for being uh, that, uh, that uh, male color of presence uh, in the mental health field. Um, Dr. Pulley, share with us a little bit about from, from your side of the table um, with regards to how you think it would be beneficial as a mental health professional for 
uh, young men of color or all men of color for that matter. And as you asked the question, Bishop Hector, I look at our panelists and there is my natural son and my spiritual sons. We all have had a conversation about therapy. There's nobody sitting on this panel tonight that I have not recommended. They came to me and wait, I Wait, 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 wait. You, you started it off right. You said, you know, with your sons, you talked to them about therapy. Then you threw shade and you said there's nobody on the panel, period, which is incredible. Oh, I wasn't talking me. about you, Bishop. Now, you didn't gave yourself away because I wasn't talking about you. <laughs> you, didn't told, you didn't told your old team I was not talking about you. I was talking about my son. But I, I will recommend it for you too and anybody else. I've recommended it for all. If you around me long get, enough, get it, I'm people. Going it's good for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going yeah. to say to you because I went to therapy and it was through. I had no plan on being a therapist. My mom was a therapist, a counselor, um, but I had no plan of being a therapist, but it was through tragedy, trauma, mm -hmm. that I came into the mental health profession. And to be able to say to my son, you know, it's nothing wrong with going to counseling, to be able to say that to him. He said, what do you think about this, Dad? I said, there's nothing wrong with being able to go to counseling and talk, because even as a parent, we don't have everything that our children need, that our offspring need. And sometimes they need to talk to somebody else and they need to know that it's okay. That it doesn't make them crazy or less than or less male. And so I think it's important that we have the male therapist as I am, but also the males um, advocating therapy, you know, as well, that we need both of them. We need the advocate and the professional to say it's okay. Um, and I want to. I love that, that. And, I, and I want to encourage. I want to encourage our men of color, in particular, to you know. I, I see what they call it. Uh, like I think they call it body shaming. Is that, am I saying it right? These they, they they call it body shaming. I think when we you know try to shame someone based on their weight, yes. let's stop. Let's stop mental health shaming, or let's stop mind shaming people who are in need of mental health uh, uh, support. Um, let's stop shaming those individuals and let's support those individuals and let's say uplifting things like, you know what, you, you know, make, you know, you make your appointment. I'm, I think I'm going to make me an appointment as well, you know, but, but let's go from shaming um, to supporting. So th thank you for saying that. Dr. Did I cut you off there? Yes. I was going to ask um, um, D. Reginald, uh, Minister Elder, um, what he what he thought about that conversation that we had about therapy? What was his what was his thought about that? It was a it was a very helpful conversation. Um, like we were talking about, like you said, the advocate. Um, he definitely advocated for me to go out and see that. You know, that was one of the first people I turned to, just because he's my dad. He's my dad, but also because I know he's a he's a Counselor as well. I just wanted to have that conversation, and we definitely throughout that process, we talked about the different options and the different things, and diagnosis, just all those different things. And it was just nice to have somebody to have that conversation with, where I can see it from the professional side. I can see it from you know my mother's perspective, my sister's perspective, who was coming to counselor and doing this time. Just yeah, you, Brittany. Yes. Congratulations, Brittany. <laughs> so, all those different yes. perspectives and shout out to all about people of color. Right. It's just to have those perspectives from that was close to me definitely made it something more comfortable. But like the person who told me to go do it, uh just initially just from the conversation with my Monica, she was just like, I need you to promise me that while you're in school, while it's free, that you wanna go get help and just start to have these conversations. And then that's where it was just like it's like kind of just pulling back an onion, just layer after layer after layer of things just breaking down. And it's still like that. So I recommend it to my friends. And when I got into it, I was definitely vocal. Like, this is what I'm doing to take care of myself. No, I am not okay. Even though I made me smile. So that way, at least on my part, I'm being more transparent to kind of take the stigma away from, you know, mental health and take the stigma away from black men sharing their emotions. I was like, I can stand up and be like, no, you see me this way, but I still go set for it. I have to make sure I'm right. Absolutely. That's and we awesome. encourage the physical checkups to go get your physical, you know, go get your checkup from the neck up. Get you a mental health checkup. Ain't nothing wrong with checking up, checking in, checking on, and checking over. And I want to encourage our young men of color to, to not only hear uh, that wisdom, but to adhere 
to yes. that kind of um, you know I, I'm, I'm really, I like, like that. that to add here yeah that's good that's good yeah that's, that's real good that's real good, that's real good. good. I like that's words yeah <laughs> that's good add here okay yeah. and so it, add it, it. it's important you know because listen um, just like with the mental health, like you said, our physical wellness is also very important. Uh, we have Gary Casey on the line with us tonight, and he shares, I just graduated from the University of Pitt. I was one of the only black males in the program for clinical social work, and the conversation is so different when you have white professors talk about mental health when he deals with black men is amazing. If we raise our voice, we're being aggressive, and this is even taught in the classroom. Wow. 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 It's we're just passionate. We're just passionate. We're just, we're just, people. Right. Yes. Yeah. And as men of color, and I, I know all too well. Um, and it's even when I was uh, their age, Dr. Pulley, even as, as a, you know, as a, uh, a person in leadership on my job, you know, as a man of color, you know, if we said something, the, you know, a certain kind of way, oh, he's intimidating, he's a bully. Um, oh, I have to seek therapy because of the way he talks to me. You know, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just scared to come down. I'm, I'm like, let me tell you something. But anyway, <laughs> it just is a, a and, flashback. In the mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think one of the, uh, especially in the, in the, um, you can hear me awesome. <laughs> um, God answered daddy. Your daddy. Within the with, within um, the black community period, I think that um, we see one hundred fifty dollars an hour, and it's like, oh no, I, I I can I can I can you know tell someone to say I can barely put food on my table, but now I, now and so I think that's also too how you know we need to be able to find resources, help individuals find resources that say, listen, they, they, they'll, they'll provide you on a sliding scale according to your income. Or hey, yeah. you know, yeah. they'll be able to you know, give you a couple of free sessions. Okay, you do have health insurance? Okay, look into your, uh, your policy to see what your copay is. Because your copay yeah. could be $30, your copay could be 20 And so we have to be able to, you know, help individuals find resources as well because i think that's one of the biggest challenges is that um if you don't have health insurance or your health insurance is not the best that it it can be very expensive it can be very um very expensive okay and we have yeah, I agree with that and dr Pulley, work with me for a moment okay and so, uh we have on mind and they, they're saying uh 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 bishop d walter you know oftentimes with people okay let me think about it but let me get back to you about it Oftentimes, money is the issue. Um, we have Tyrell D. Moy that says, hey, listen, I am a black man living well with a mental health diagnosis. Therapy, medication, and self-care. This conversation is so, so valuable tonight. And self-care are the practices I use um, and use, I would imagine, to stay well. I am what mental health looks like. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, we have uh, someone that says, I totally agree with the panel in regards to therapy. Me being a fairly young black male working in mental health as a psychiatric rehabilitation specialist can attest to the need of more black males in the field. Uh, we have um, uh, Mr. Gina Dorsey, who uh, is thanking you all for the transparency, as she shares that mental illness is real. We have to stop shaming people who really need the help. If we encourage people to talk to someone, we could possibly help prevent even some suicides. And come on, uh, gentlemen, let's all say amen to that. Amen. amen. I heard um, I heard Reggie. Hey, Reggie, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I heard Reggie also give a shout out to his uh, older, one of his older siblings, because he's got, um, he has two of them. Um, that she, for Dr. Pulley, you have a son who's preaching, just like you. And then you have a daughter who is in uh, mental health, just like you. And I, I thought that was just so nice, uh, Darrell, for you to, um, you know, to give your sister that kind of shout out. Um, and so, you know, so, yeah, we, we highlighted men of color um, and the benefit of men of color uh, being in uh, the mental health profession, but also women of color, seeing people of color in, in the in these awesome fields, it is absolutely 
Um, awesome. I heard you say Dr. Brittany. Um, I know, uh, Dr. Pulley, that you have another daughter uh, who also bears the name of Dr. Davina Jones. Um, and so I oh. uh, she stopped by uh, to, to see us on tonight. Um, you know, it, it was supposed to be what about our young black men? Um, but it, it seems like all your daughters, there's Christine. Uh, <laughs> looks like, you know, so the girls hit me up and they were like, um, discrimination against blacks or discrimination against females. Bishop Hector, you invited the sons, but you didn't invite the daughters. It, okay. it really was an attack. And I was like, are y'all trying to like bully me? Like, you do you, you know, like it's my show, right? You're not like, you what, what? Like, oh, listen. God. How do y'all know that y'all want to go get your own week? Like, you want to say, how do you know you want to get your own week? I believe I see a week in your future. I see a week. Yeah, oh, dude, we gonna intrude on y'all week. You see how that works? When, when it comes time, we gonna intrude on y'all week too. So, so you know, so the reality you know becomes that this is yet another challenge for our young color is that the females won't give them. No, let me stop right there. Uh, <laughs> We don't want the thread going off about they that. Won't, they won't let us be great. Okay? They, they will not let us be great. We can't have one night. If uh, only for one night. Right. If only for one night. Okay, did Davina not have a midday moment already? Already? <laughs> Can you Jeez. Did she not? So now she got to have the Christine. midday and the nighttime moment? Commission midday moment, nighttime. Christine selling jewelry. She stopped selling jewelry to come talk. I'm tired. What's wrong? Oh, y'all, y'all are doing it. For you who are watching us and thinking, okay, this is gotten a roll out of hand. There is a there is a reality that we want to share with you. Um, Dr. Uh, Darella Pulley, my spiritual leader, um, my confidant. My mental health professional, you know, like yes. oh, yes. uh, you know, <laughs> supposed to be my brother that can catch out the bag, um, <laughs> is turning half a century, will be 50 years old tomorrow. And so we <laughs> would it be to bring the sons and some of the daughters together oh, with this so man a happy 50th birthday on his birthday eve of and so that's what this is all about, Dr. Pulley. <laughs> happy birthday to you, Christine. Go ahead and, and 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 give words to your dad for his birthday. Well, I saved these words for the time that I will see you in person, but I am so grateful yeah. for this opportunity. You mean so much to me, and I am so grateful to just be able to celebrate this moment in this time with you. So I celebrate you. I love you. I bless you. you. And many, 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 many more. Thank you. Thank and you. listen, while we're talking about all types of, you know, we talked about mental health. We talked about, uh, we talked about mental health. We talked about physical, physical health. health. And, yes. and, and looking at Christine, let me tell you something. Dental health. This girl got teeth. Let me, your teeth are absolutely amazing. Oh, um, <laughs> listen. <laughs> listen. <laughs> Amazing, 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 amazing. Well, can I say something quickly? Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed the portion of the program that uh, the conversation that you all were having because uh, mental health is so important and because it's such been such a taboo in families and especially in our culture to have inter been introduced to Dr. Pulley and to have um all of what god it wasn't it, it was such a a um a complete and thorough experience with dr pulley as and i'm so grateful because he brought everything he is and it took like two sessions for me and i was like wait a minute hold up i you can't leave yet so i had i had to i stalked him i like went online like where can i find dr pulley again you know wow. and so i'm grateful you just to, have, to be a yes. part absolutely yes i was a client oh okay and, and, and i'm sorry i i just figured I said it so much that everybody no, knew. Like but yeah, I I started off, I met Dr. Pulley as a client. And I'm telling you from the first moment, the first session, I was, I bawled. I think every time I got on the phone with him because I just felt the 
the complete release and he was really reminding me of who I am and that was so therapeutic for me and it was it's just a blessing so I thank you just in every aspect of who you are you've been such a blessing to me and I, I'm so grateful and we honor your transparency Christine and yes I do believe you have mentioned it you know I've heard you mention it before, but you know, HIPAA and things like that, I don't have the right to online give you the opportunity to become a millionaire off of me. Right. So for me to say on the thread, well, y'all know she yeah. was like this client. Yeah, you all right. <laughs> so, yeah, no, don't do me like that. Dr. DeVita, you want to say your spiritual to your dad? I will be very brief. First of all, um, I desire to say to um, Dr. Brittany, congratulations. And uh, to both thank you, you and D. Reginald. <laughs> and to you and D. Reginald, I desire to say thank you for sharing your father. Um, yeah. That's I, I just feel that's important to say. Um, I'm blessed to have an amazing natural dad and we share him with so many people. So I don't take it for granted. And I say yeah. to you, thank you for sharing your father with us and to dr pulley happy birthday you know we love you and that's all i'm gonna say because the hour is passing <laughs> uh Brittany, i'm gonna let you go so you want me to start off with you so you know i've heard you almost all your life you know how daddy daddy but i'm gonna let you uh, go ahead and say something to your daddy tonight go ahead well i know i'm in the field because of my daddy and i i just know that he had such a big impact on why I want to be a counselor and also why I want to be a doctor in the future. So thank you so much for setting the standard and always being a role model of excellence for me and my whole family. Um, and oh, I really look forward you. to the party tomorrow. Yay! Join us. Join us. And so I just want to uh, thank you, uh, thank you, ladies, for you know coming to be a part. And Dr. Foley, I do want to give you a plug, and I'm also going to put some responsibility on you, if I might, by saying if there is someone who, I mean, and, and Bishop D. Walker has put some great information on the thread. I encourage all of you to check that out. Um, uh, but Dr. Pulley, uh, you know, if people have questions about how to connect or how to go about finding the right one, um, if you don't mind, so I'm going to go ahead and and say hit us up in our inbox. Um, and you know we can we can network with you and you know get you connected or if you have questions about how does the scale work and things of that nature you know we, we want to be a resource we want to we want to help you as best we can Bishop Doctor. Packer, I want to say I know Kenny might have to go because I think the night review yes 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 yeah. oh he good you good oh so the okay boy oh I could cry let me say something um, Bishop Rogers my son you have inspired me this evening when you talk about the cost. Mm -hmm. And I have some clients who pay more than their sessions, that double or triple their sessions, because they said if anybody ever comes to you and they need counseling, especially preachers, they said, I don't want you to have to turn them away because they cannot afford it. And so I'm mm -hmm. gonna start, because of Bishop Rogers, I'm gonna start a, a mental health fund to be able to fund and not just coming to me, but people who desire yeah. mental health, but may need some support with that to be able to help subsidize what it is that they need. I have been inspired. I mean, I know this is a conversation, my sons and blessings, but I have been inspired. I'm trying not to cry, but I have been inspired this evening to start a mental health fund where nobody that needs help, especially those in the church, especially those who are preachers and teachers, would not be able to get the help that they need. Amen. I mean, that's amazing. And Dr. Pulley, for your 50th birthday, I'm gonna sell $50 into that fund. Um, I think that, that is absolutely amazing. And the kingdom mm -hmm. of you to say, but the, the kingdom nerve of you, because because one person's nerve is another person's necessity, Dr. Davina. The kingdom nerve of you to say- You're on that tonight, Bishop. You're on tonight, You're on tonight, You're on tonight, You're on tonight, tonight Bishop. Fund is not only gonna be for me, but for just giving them some mental health, um, period, no matter who they go to, uh, I'm, I'm going to develop this fund. And so if anybody uh, desires, and, and Bishop D. Walker, if you can help me uh, to sow into that, listen, uh, we, I'm going to give you two cash caps. Uh, you can do, um, you know, no, let's not do two, but that's duality. And we're not going to do double-minded um, tonight um, when we talk about mental health. And so dollar sign, C-O-T-E-K, Bishop Rogers. That's it. If you'll put that in the thread, 
Um, and if you wanted to go to the fund, just put fund and listen, we, listen, we're people, we're men and women of integrity. We don't play those kind of games. All right. Mm -hmm. I, I feel, I feel tongues covered in, but, um, <laughs> but listen, so if you just go ahead and put, can I say, can I speak and, very quickly? Yes. Come on. Absolutely. And let me speak very quickly. Um, there's a, uh, uh, a therapist that I worked with. I had the pleasure of working with Tracy Horn. Uh, she was watching tonight. I don't know if she was able to stay on, but she was watching tonight. I met her in Jacksonville. She relocated to the Clearwater area. She saw an earlier Kingdom conversation and was so impressed. She's uh, desiring to reach out and do some work with Dr. Pulley. And so you have some information in your inbox from her as well. And uh, she watched my midday moment and she, um, I'm going to say it publicly, but I, I, I pray that it's respectful, but she sowed into the midday moment. I'm going to take her seed and sow her seed into this fund. Amen. Wow. Wow. So all seeds that come in tonight, as a matter of fact, any seed that comes in, for those you know, for those that, that um, we're going to just sow into Kingdom Conversations, all seeds that come in tonight are going to go to uh, uh, the Dr. Darrell R. Pulley Mental Health Fund. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm a tithe bishop, and my birthday is tomorrow, and I have received some birthday gifts. What I hear the Spirit saying is that whatever I have received for my birthday financially, the tithe of that, I'm going to tithe to this fund. I have been, I have been inspired tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean. Wow. I couldn't hear for a while that the thing was crazy, but this is this is God, y'all. I oof. Amen. That nobody who desires help yeah. would not be able to get it. Praise God. That's a blessing. Woo. I ain't even mad at you no more. <laughs> Thanks. <again. laughs> I'm just gonna let it go. <laughs> All that talk about, you know, let's not be scared and, uh, you know, it's fear and, you know, the man with the gun is scared of you. I, I'm, I'm letting that go. I'm on, I'm I'm you know what? They need therapy. The police officers need therapy. They need therapy. <laughs> they got their own fun. <laughs> welcome to our show. Welcome to, welcome, welcome to the conversation. Welcome to the conversation. <laughs> and so, and Pastor, we will set up a, you know, we, we got Dr. Brittany, we got Dr. Pulley. We're going to set up a, 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 a segment. Um, Let me say, Dr. Brittany. Brittany is prophetic. She just got her master's and her clinical license. And she's always said since she was a little girl, when I said, what do you want to be? She said, a doctor. So I've been prophesying and speaking prophetically, mm -hmm. Dr. Brittany, so that she will keep moving in the direction of yeah. that. Yeah. But she is a licensed exactly. and professional, but I still call her Dr. Brittany until I see it coming to manifestation. Yeah, anybody got yeah. a problem with that? Uh, I don't, yeah, Dr. Uh, Brittany, it is. So we, 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 decree, we decree on this show. We don't we don't have any uh, issues with that at, at all, sir. Um, you know, Dr. Brittany. Dr. Brittany, it is. There you go. Dr. Brittany. <laughs> Amen. Let's just have a whole prophetic moment. It is so, so it is. So Amen. we let it be. Yeah. So, so we let it be. Yes. Amen. Amen. So we Amen. Amen. So so we, we thank God. And so listen, I know y'all like, well, hey, what happened to the show? But this man is turning 50. If it was your 50th birthday, you'd want us to press pause for you too. So, you know, we thank you for sitting with us, celebrating this man of God. He is a great yeah. man of God. We love yeah. him. We respect him. We admire him. And so, um, Dr. Pulley, you know, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you from all of us. Ladies, thank you for, for yeah. stopping in with us on tonight and blessing us with your graceful and beautiful presence. I'm going to go ahead, I'm just going to go ahead and just put y'all back. Um, put, go ahead and say good night to the ladies. Um, and I'm going to close up with the brothers. If that's thank all. you, Dr. Davina. Love you all. Good, good night. night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Guys, to keep it brief, thank you for so much for uh, being a part of tonight's conversation. Uh, we pray that it was a blessing to you. It was certainly a blessing to us. And we can tell by the thread that it was a blessing to so many others. Um, so, uh, uh, Reggie, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, Kenny, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, D. Walter, or Bishop D. Walter, uh, thank you for, for joining us on tonight. Dr. Pulley, thank you uh, for joining us as always. Again, you heard it here. Uh, we're starting a Dr. Darrell R. Pulley Mental Health Awareness Fund. And so all sowing uh, goes uh, to, to that. And so if you, if you desire to sow in, um, if you see fit to sow in, 
I know that you're sewing into um, a, a great thing. And so it is dollar sign C O T E K and all monies tonight will go uh, towards that fund. Um, we're going to kick it off or for this, for this great man's birthday, dollar sign C O T E K and put in fund. And we're going to, we're going to help some folks. Amen. We're going to help some folks. Uh, just like somebody helped us. And we thank God for that. Thank um, you, God. And then finally, like I said, please go to the Kingdom Conversations uh, page and check out uh, the short uh, the short video on Target. It's already there for you. And just leave your response, leave your reaction. I'll also try to put it in the thread. Um, but thank you all uh, so much. Dr. Pulley, uh, before I say the final good night, anything you want to say to the people? Happy birthday, sir. Anything thank you, you, thank you for all the birthday love. But I am so excited about this mental health fund. I feel like this is, this is, the answer to somebody and the solution come is on. Come, come on come on it is because i just don't desire that to be the reason i i thought about what d Rogers said when his mom said to him why are you in college and why it's free make sure you commit to get some counseling you know and so that so all of these pieces and then i thought about kenny when when i talked to uh, Kenneth about counseling. When that woman, how much was she, Kenny? A hundred and what? One hundred and fifty American dollars. <laughs> she was a hundred fifty dollars, and so he was like, "Okay, I go to counseling, but this hundred fifty dollars is, is a lot of money." And so I'm looking at all of this, how all things are working. Bishop Rogers, how all of my sons have worked together this evening to really bring this into expression. And so I'm, I'm full of gratitude. Thank you, Bishop Hector. Yes, can. can I say this real quick? Mm -hmm. This is I, I, I'm I'm praising God tonight because this is kingdom. This is the kingdom. We don't just talk about problems. We 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 make solutions. We don't just have questions and leave people with questions. We give answers. That is the kingdom of God. This is an answer. This is a solution. And 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 like like Rogers was saying, it's a real thing. Like we talk about counseling and going to therapy and laying on people's couches. And I know for myself, it was, and it's an investment that you're making in yourself. But if you don't know the value of the investment and $150 will turn you off quick. I mean, it'll just turn you off and you may need it. And so I appreciate and I praise God for this answer, for the solution tonight. That we didn't just highlight a problem, highlight a challenge, but we saw it all the way through. And there is a solution. There is an answer. That's that's a blessing. Man. Awesome. Well, listen, everyone, thank you so much for hanging in with us tonight. You know, come back next Monday. Kingdom Conversations went a little over, uh, a little over time tonight because of the great man of God's birthday. Typically, we do end right about 9, 9, 15. Um, so come on back next week, y'all. Uh, next week, we're talking about bishops. Why are there so many? So, <laughs> Ooh, that's back. a conversation. That's a conversation Ooh, to be you're had. A bishop, and you're a bishop, and you're a bishop, and you're a bishop. Wow. Right. Go from there. You get a crochet. You get a minor. You get a minor. Wow. You get a ring. Right. You get a ring. It might not be a real ring, but you get a ring. a real one. <laughs> why are there so many? Oh and I remember that thing. Okay, why are bishop wow. why are there so many? We're going to talk Is about that only for bishops? The, no, the anybody panel, can come to the conversation. And, 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 you only got bishops talking now. You mean on the panel? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, but I think you might be surprised at how that conversation, you know, you can count on me. <laughs> so um, we still, we'll be talking about the, the, the Episcopacy, the authenticity or the lack thereof. Um, you know, you know, and, you know, so apostolic succession. We'll be talking about, you know, we'll be having that kind of conversation yes. um, on next week. Bishops, why are there so many? Yes, that's what Kingdom Conversation is all about. Right here on Monday nights at 8 p.m., folks. Look, y'all have, um, uh, fellas, y'all hang on with me. I'm going to end the broadcast, and then I'll say something to you all. But listen, everybody have a safe night. Be safe. Be well. Mentally well, physically well, spiritually well, organizationally well, socially well, financially yeah. well, emotionally well. Be well. Those are the seven target areas of wellness for the kingdom. Be well. We love you. God bless you. Fellas, on behalf of the Facebook Live audience, thank you so much for being with us on tonight. Kenny, we're not going to do May the Lord Watch. You can go ahead and put your hand there. It's all good. Um, <laughs> he's, so, he's so churchy, y'all. He's so churchy. It was my right hand, too. I'm waiting. <laughs>
He's on fire for the Lord. He's on fire for the Lord. He's on fire for the Lord. Good night, everybody. God bless it. Good night. Yeah. Good night.